Hi, my name is Dr. Catherine Hughes from Crime Psych. I'm a criminal psychologist and I run a business that enables me to bring knowledge and learning to everyone, not just those who are studying at schools, colleges and university. And I do this by producing a range of blogs, vlogs, vlogs and free online courses. But I do also run slightly more in-depth courses, which are both face-to-face -face and online. They're on a range of subjects and you don't need any previous qualifications with me. So after you've finished watching this video, you can head on over to my website and have a look at the range of courses that I've got available. This video isn't the normal type of video that I produce. Because of the coronavirus and lockdown situation, I decided to focus this video on the psychology of it all and how it can be useful to understand and predict behaviour in a crisis or a disaster. The ways in which people behave and respond during a disaster or crisis, such as the coronavirus pandemic, is different to how they would respond in a personal crisis. In general, People feel very threatened and fearful. So it is really important to give people as much information as possible during the process. This way, people feel more empowered to make decisions on how best to keep themselves safe and what actions they can do. They may exaggerate their communication responses. They may revert back to more basic or instinctive fight or flight type reasoning. We know that there are four main ways that people process information during a crisis. The first is that we tend to simplify the messages that we get. Because we're under stress, we can become easily overloaded by information. And that's certainly true during this um, coronavirus pandemic. There is so much information available, so many um contradicting views and information that we see all over the internet and on television, it can be difficult to know which aspects to focus on. And this means that we sometimes don't remember all of the relevant information. As we know, we have information coming in from multiple sources and it can be very difficult to determine which parts of it are true and what advice that we should actually follow this means that we tend to fall back onto our old habits and follow bad examples sometimes set by others. The second thing we do is we tend to hold on to our current beliefs. We all watched this coronavirus pandemic begin in China and then start to move around the world. But that was them and not us. So when some people in this country did begin to become infected, very few saw the direct consequences of it. The elderly and vulnerable were then asked to self-isolate for 12 weeks. This is asking people to act when there's no perceived personal threat. And so we saw many elderly and vulnerable people still moving around. They fall back into their own beliefs of it's not here yet, or I can't touch it if I'm only going, I can't get it if I'm only going to the shops quick. I'm not going to touch anything. I'm only going to be shopping with all the other elderly and vulnerable people. And I know this because my own mother would go to the Asda at 7 a.m. for the elderly slot and believe that she was somehow safe because it was a dedicated time for elderly and vulnerable people. The third thing that we do is we tend to look for other advice and opinions. Therefore, it's important to give consistent and simple messages to people regarding what they should or shouldn't do. For example, when the UK went into a full lockdown and told people that only key workers should open for business, there was a great deal of confusion as to who the key workers were, what that included. There were hairdressers, off licenses, takeaways, all unsure of whether they should stay open or not. And this led to confusion and questioning of who should and shouldn't stay in. We've all seen families, full families in the supermarket together during the lockdown, and they believe that they're allowed to go out together because they're all from the same family. We see people outside being less than six feet apart because they think that the fresh air makes them somewhat less vulnerable. We see gangs of youths hanging out together because they're unafraid of the consequences of catching this virus. Finally, we tend to believe 
the first response that we hear. So officials need to act quickly to get out a national message. I believe that the UK was a little slow to do this. We knew that this was coming long before it arrived and a clear contingency plan could have and should have been placed, put into place before it even entered into the UK. In general, though, people behave quite rationally during a crisis. They take actions which they see are relevant to them. I did mention in a previous video on how to look after your mental health during this threat and isolation that we behave in ways relevant to the magnitude of the threat. So we knew that this virus was going to be quite a big threat and we're told to simply wash our hands. And most people did see this action as insufficient. And that is where the panic buying of goods started because we've seen it as quite a big threat. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't understand um, how this was going to affect us. So we immediately started by panic buying. Collective human behaviour has been studied during many different types of crisis and disaster. There have been natural disasters, there have been hurricanes, there's been floods, there's been fires. There's been all kinds of disasters that we've learned from. We've also studied man-made crises such as the 9-11 attack and various other terrorist attacks. Even when we're not directly affected by the event itself, we're indirectly affected. We are emotionally invested in it and can experience some negative emotions as a result. As I speak, recording this now, we're beginning our second week of lockdown in the UK. The government has acknowledged that this may have a negative impact on our mental health. We are social creatures. We've evolved to live in communities and to have daily interaction with each other. Therefore, it's of little surprise that we're now all struggling with the current situation. I will leave a link to the other video that I did on how to best look after your mental health during isolation in the comments in the video description below. People in the community are feeling fearful, anxious, confused and dismayed. Some of these feelings can be addressed by official communications that give clear and honest advice on what we know and what we don't know and what they are going to do for us. It's important that people don't feel helpless. People can be more empowered by official information, such as saying it's been scientifically proven that washing your hands more often will reduce the risk of spreading this virus. Official guidance should guide people to, make, to take achievable actions for themselves. And these actions might be something symbolic, such as putting a flag up or creating a family check-in plan. It can be actions such as going out on a Thursday evening, 8pm, and clapping all our NHS workers. It can be actions such as plating rainbows in your window. And these are all achievable and actions that we can take to feel like we're being part of it and making a difference and actually helping and supporting. However, as far as our negative emotions go in isolation, how would you feel if I told you that your emotions are caused by society in general, by the ways in which we've become separated from each other even before this isolation, by the way that we've been led to believe over so many years that if you don't have this car or that perfume or these clothes, then you're not enough. We live in a consumerist society. Industries have made billions and billions of pounds and, and dollars off our own insecurities. Almost every advert that you see on television or online will have the underlying message of you will be a better person if you have this or use this. You will be happier once you have this. You will be liked more once you look like this. We as a society, no longer evaluate ourselves by our own personal values, but by the amount of things that we have or by the way that we look. Over a number of years, we've been led to think that the more money that you have, the better you are. The more possessions that we have, the better we are. 
industries spend massive amounts of money to try to convince all of us of these facts. There is even a whole branch of psychology dedicated to making people think this way, which is marketing psychology. However, true happiness comes from within. It comes from getting to know yourself. I bet there are thousands of people around the world locked up with their husbands or wives and thinking, what the hell did I marry? I know that if I was locked down with any of my exes, I'd probably be arrested for violence right now. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but I wouldn't like to be locked up with them. We've forgotten how to sit with ourselves and understand what we're thinking and feeling and how to process our own emotions. Life is so fast paced and filled with so many distractions that we don't have time or we haven't had time to acknowledge our own thoughts and feelings. So when we're forced into situations like this, we're forced to just sit alone, sit with a few family members to reflect on what's going on. Now that we're in lockdown, there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to distract us from ourselves. I think many of you have probably overeaten. I know that I have. Some of you might have drank more than normal. Some of you are on social media, media or on the internet more than normal. And we do this simply because we want to fill an empty void. We want to pass the time. We want to relieve the boredom to stop overthinking, to stop worrying, to distract ourselves. We don't take enough responsibility and feel that we're powerless against this, which is a completely normal way to feel. And many, many people feel the same way. However, by focusing on and acknowledging your feelings and recognizing that your happiness starts and ends with you, you will be much more content without the distractions of life, without the things, without going off on a bit of a counseling tangent. The most succinct piece of advice I can give to you is to live in the moment. Don't focus on the next week or the next month, but on today, on right now. If you bake a cake, what does it smell like? What do those smells remind you of? How does it taste? How does it feel to cook something from scratch? If you're going out for a walk, what can you hear as you put one foot in front of the other? Can you hear birds? cars, people. The happiest way to live your life is to focus on the day that you're in, focus on the present and focus on the moment that you're in. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow isn't promised. Laugh, talk, play, dance with your family if you live with them. If not, get on the phone or do a video call. If you have no family, reach out to friends or support groups or organisations. The simple pleasures of enjoying whatever it is that you've chosen to do will never be able to be taken away from you. It's not dependent on the entertainment industry carrying on. It's not dependent on what clothes you wear or how much makeup you've got on or how you look. All that matters is that it's something that brings you joy and is of value to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I do hope that you've enjoyed it and I hope that you're coping with isolation okay and enjoying connecting with each other. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.